class and welcome to your Sibelius specific tutorial on chord symbols. This is certainly one of the most important topics we'll be discussing this semester. Now in Sibelius we've got something a little bit interesting. So for those of us who've been using the program since its early versions, um, we have the option to use what's called legacy chord symbol input. Let me show you what that is. So it's actually under the main Sibelius menu under preferences and it's kind of buried away under the bottom most item which is other here so you can see I've currently got this turned off or disabled nine times out of ten that's the way we're gonna to want to keep it for the class I do want to show it to you because a few of you may have been using this for several years so if I enable this feature and I hit OK um, then what this lets me do is it lets me use what's referred to as a chord menu so if I click on this measure or I can click on a rest or a note Let's just click on the measure for now. And I do a Command K, that would be Control K for PC users. So Command K, I've got the flashing cursor. Let's say I know I've got some kind of C chord. Okay, so capital C. And you should always use capital letters uh, for the root. And then we are going to either Control click or right click. And we get this cool menu. And it's a long one, it goes off your screen here. But in some cases, um, this menu alone makes it worth it to be using legacy input. You know, the other advantage to this would be um, maintaining compatibility with your existing files, um, as with any legacy-oriented um, item. So the menu can skip around a little bit at times. I feel like it's gotten a little buggy over the years. As you can see, it's sort of flipping around here. But just so you're aware of that option. So as I mentioned for now, we're going to go ahead and we're going to um, disable the legacy as an option. So uncheck that, hit OK, and we're back here again. Some of the advantages of the non-legacy import have to do, well, there's several of them. They have to do with the realization of chords or being able to hear the chords played back uh, via a plugin. Uh, also the creation of chord entry shortcuts. So we've got shortcuts that can be created by the user uh, for say chords that have a lot of extensions. And then finally, um, the stacking of chords. So when we talk about stacking chord symbols, we're talking about something that's different or distinct from the linear approach. So let's say I had an A dominant seven, and I'm looking at Gary Lindsay's textbook on page 28 here, the 12th chord down has multiple chord extensions. So if I used a linear approach to this, it would be A7 with a sharp nine comma flat 13, all right? So that's a linear uh, chord symbol. To do this in stacked, we would go A7, and then the highest extension the flat 13 on top with the sharp nine on bottom and that's in parentheses also. This is the more commonly used approach at this point and that's largely having to do with saving space. If you're playing um, a chord chart, uh, say a Thad Jones big band piece, you might have eight chord symbols per measure with a lot of these extensions. So it becomes unreasonable to use the, the linear uh, format at that point. So you can use one or the other. If you do choose to use linear, then the small number comes first, comma, and the larger of the extension numbers. All right, so that's stacked versus linear chords. Um, and there's a very important dialogue that uh, has to do with that, and that would be if we came into appearance engraving rules. And so this is going to, if I come down to chord symbols, be where I dictate which of those two formats I prefer to use. I'm gonna stick with a stacked arrangement um, for right now. So uh, we've got some other options in this engraving rules as long as we're here. I would say the two most important other options are the suffix elements. This is sort of a global way of letting Sibelius what style of notation you prefer. Uh, I could tell you right now that I prefer something more similar to C capital M capital A7 then I do C small m small a small j7. When I see lowercase characters, to me it instantly signifies a minor chord. So I really prefer not to use those for major type chords. So I'm gonna go ahead and use this radio button here. Um, and then up above, we've got some other options. Uh, you can see we've got this, you know, capitalized, not 
capitalized, and so on and so forth. This largely has to do with whether we wanted to indicate uh, minor with a slash and major with a triangle, which we are not going to use for this class. Okay, you can see there on Lindsay page 28 that those are not recommended. They're unclear. Uh, there's sort of a shorthand way of doing things. So I'm going to go with these settings for now. The other important setting on this display has to do with whether we want to have extension suffix elements for one, two, three, or four more alterations or extensions. So I think sometimes it's overkill to have parentheses on a single extension dominant chord, for example. Like if you look at Lindsay's C7 sharp 11, there's a parentheses there with the sharp 11. It's fine, it's not a problem, uh, but sometimes less is more. So in that case, if you did not want to see the parentheses around the sharp 11, there's only one extension, you'd select two for this figure right here, okay? So I'm gonna kind of roll with those um, settings right now. I'm gonna hit okay. And then I am going to return to my main screen here. And just to make you aware that we've got, I mentioned a moment ago, the engraving rules chord symbols is almost like a global settings. Um, we can adjust the text for specific chord symbols. So if I go to the text tab, and then this tiny little arrow with a box is called a dialogue launch button. And so I click on that. And if you ever have a hard time clicking on any of these, by the way, you can also use um, the key tips. So if I hit control on my Mac, uh, you'll see that I get these little abbreviation characters, which can sometimes be useful uh, for getting us around some of these um, harder to reach buttons. So anyway, the dialogue launcher and the edit chord symbols dialog comes up. Now, I've mentioned that we've got our major type chords. I'm wanting those, under the major seven type chords, I'm wanting those to have a capital M uh, A with the seven. So this looks pretty close. I'm gonna take a look here at this suffix. So I'm gonna click on this edit suffix, bring up this dialog, and I have the option to override. Okay, remember that we had the sort of global settings from that um, engraving rules. I can override the appearance here. I want to have an M that looks really distinctively capital. To me, this might be a small M. So I'm going to scroll down here, and yeah, these guys look very capitalized to me. So I'm going to select third from the bottom option here, and I'm going to hit OK. And I want to show you one more thing while I'm at it, which is the idea that we can create shortcuts in Sibelius for text um, entry of chord symbols. Now this is really neat, and it sort of comes from Finale. As a Finale user for a number of years, I used to get really tired of having to enter multiple extensions for a chord symbol. So it's a lot easier for us to, I'm going to come down to our dominant chord choices here, and that's where you typically are going to have these really long chords or chord symbols, and I'm going to find this one right here. It's the dominant seven with a sharp nine, sharp five. And you can see I've assigned a shortcut here. It says colon 76. So I hit apply after entering my shortcut, and the reason I chose colon 76 is because that's how it's been for years in Finale. So I'm gonna go ahead and close the dialog now, and I'm gonna click on the measure, Command or Control K. Now check this out, if I hit capital C and then colon, and then 7-6, and I hit spacebar, it instantly interprets that as the alter dominant that we were just looking at a moment ago. So I think really worthwhile to set up some chord shortcuts. All right, let's get rid of that, and let's just start entering in some of these chords. I'll play a few of them for you from Gary Lindsay's page 28 from the top down under chord symbols. So just entering capital C, and to move to the next measure, you know, I'm going to hit the spacebar several times, okay? And if there were notes there, uh, the space bar would advance me from one note to the next note. So I get C now, and in Gary Lindsay's book, we've got this lowercase m, lowercase a, followed by a seven. Well, at least the seven isn't slashed. You never want to use a European or slash style seventh unless you're writing for a polka band. A slash seven actually means major seven. It does not mean dominant seven. So unless you're playing for a polka band or writing for a polka band, stay away from the sort of Euro or slash sevens. So I've got my capital C here, and then I am entering MA7. Now, 
Look what happens to my M here. As soon as I hit the space bar, notice that sort of turns into a capital M. That's because of what we just set up in that edit chord symbols dialog. All right, so I don't actually have to enter a capital M at this point, but for sure, remember to enter a, um, a capital root name. Okay, so C in this case. All right, so yeah, the C major seven chord. Just like that. You know, we'll talk about how this might be voiced a variety of different ways. Do a drop two, in which case I get this kind of voicing, but that's the basic sound of that chord. So moving on, now remember that we made that adjustment with a capital M here to that major seven. Now we didn't do that specifically for a major nine chord. So we know that we've got our global engraving rules, but it's not a bad idea to check in our chord symbols to see whether we've made that change on the major nine chord. Right. And this is why it's good to do as much as you can globally before you have to dive into doing all this. So you can see here that you know we've got that um, sort of a superscript with a small m, small a, 9. So if I wanted to change that, then I'm editing the suffix. I'm going to override the appearance. I'm going to make it look more like what we just had a moment ago. All right. And I can close that. Okay, so clicking on this measure, C, just whatever, good old M, because it's going to make it large anyway, 9. And by the way... If I type C M A J 9, it's going to again condense it to my sort of preferred version of the chord. All right. So a C major 9, if you look in the Gary Lindsay book, he tells you what it is. It's the same as a C major 7 plus the ninth. So So it could be voiced like that, it could be voiced any number of ways. We'll talk about that later. That's the sound of that chord. We got our C6. Now the sixth chord is one of the few exceptions where you've got a number that comes right after the root, the C here, and it's not a dominant chord. In almost every other instance, if you've got a number coming after the letter of the root, then you are dealing with a dominant chord, except for a few exceptions, uh, the five among them, which is literally just, uh, well, the power chord, C and G. But uh, C6 chord sounds like this. It's got that kind of 1940s vocal group sound to it. Okay, so that's a six chord, and it's not a dominant chord. Moving on, we've got our C69, so capital C, and the 69 is going to automatically insert, you'll see here a slash between the six and the nine, which is the generally accepted way of writing this chord. C7, although not according to Lindsay's table. Of course, if you wanted to, you could go into your chord symbols and set that up the other way. C dominant seven, let me play these two chords for you. So C69 does not have a seven. We don't have that note. That's the note, okay, it's kind of a pretty chord. Our C dominant seven, finally we've got a dominant chord. All right, so we've got the major triad to the lower seventh. And then moving on here, we've got our C9. So just as with the C69, we're adding the 9. Okay, or maybe it's stacked a different way. Something like that. Okay, but it's got that D in there. We've got our C13. So that's going to have an A somewhere in the voicing. And then we are moving on to a C7 sharp 11 number, which we talked about the extension a moment ago when we were talking about the engraving rules. So I believe we set it up so that there'd be no parentheses around that 11. Let's see what happens if we try typing a parentheses in around that 11. Notice that it reverts back, okay? By the way, if you ever make the changes in either one of those dialogues, the engraving rules or the edit chord symbols, and it's not being reflected or updated, what you can do, and let's just do this as an example here. Let's say that I want parentheses around all of these. Well, it gave it to me, didn't it? But there will be instances where that doesn't happen, uh, in which case what you'll do is you click on the chord, and then you select the Appearance tab, and one of these Reset to Design um, uh, buttons will resolve that. Okay, so the C7 sharp 11 is a cool chord with that tension. <laughs> So moving on, we've got um, C7 flat 9, and some of these chord symbols that have extensions have corresponding pages in the Gary Lindsay book, page 193, 
does a really good job explaining where these chords come from and what the related scales are for them. C7 lowercase b9 and C13 lowercase b9. Play these for you. Here's this one. Rub and then C3. All right, this comes from diminished harmony. Then we will move on here to the C. Here we got our one that's going to get stacked. So C7 parentheses sharp nine comma flat thirteen and parentheses. Look at that, it stacks it right there for us. Okay. Now I've got a bunch of C minor type chords in a row, so C minor triad first. I'm using a small M, small I for those. And look at this, it has blown off the I. So I don't really like that. I'm gonna to come to my engraving rules and I wanna make sure that we are set up with this for our radio box. That way I won't have to go and edit all these minor type chords individually. So I hit OK and that's now fixed. Alright, and if I did want to bring the bass line down to that MI, of course I could go into my chord symbols editing, right? I could come in here. I could go to my minor triad, edit suffix, override the appearance, and then do something that's along the lines of this, okay? So that would that would bring me to be a little bit more consistent with what I've been doing up to this point. All right. All right, and notice that this wasn't reflected, this change, so I go to appearance and reset to score design. Notice now that it's been updated. All right, so moving on here, C minor seven. Again, we didn't update that specific chord, but I'm just gonna move on. C minor nine, C minor six. Now the C six that's minor does need that bit of information there, that MI, okay, to uh, differentiate it from the C major six, which is simply C six. All right, then we've got our C half diminished. You've seen the empty set before, but for this class, I would like you to use C minor seven lowercase five. It's much clearer. Then we've got our C augmented. I could enter this as C A U G as it says it's doing that automatically for me if I let go. But in this case, I'm going to just spell it C plus. C, I actually prefer C dominant seven with a sharp five for this notation. And then we've got our diminished. So C, let's see what happens if I hit lowercase O. Now it gives me diminished there by default. So again, uh, maybe a matter of going into our text chord symbols and then resolving for our diminished here, editing the suffix, overriding the appearance such that we're using this instead. Okay, let's resolve that. So now we come to appearance and then we reset to score design. All right, now we didn't do that to the C fully diminished seven. So that would be the next step before we even enter it. We're gonna come in here for our seventh chord there at the suffix. And here we're going to go like this. All right. So now we've got C lowercase, just like that. All right, let me show you how to realize these chord symbols. I didn't play all of these ones towards the bottom for you, uh, but here's how you could hear what these chords sound like. Now, Sibelius isn't quite as strong with this as MuseScore. Uh, I would recommend checking out my video on MuseScore's Realize Chord Symbols function. Well, in Sibelius, we call this Realize Chord Voicings. They're very similar, uh, but you only get uh, four note voicing in Sibelius, so the root's one of the notes, so it's not as strong. I'm gonna make a selection here across the entire range of measures, so click on one of the measures, hold Shift, and then the measure at the other end of the range. Then we're going to, I use the ribbon all the time for this, I'm just gonna start typing in Realize and there it is. I'm going to click on that dialog, and then we've got this. I like to show it in a piano. I'm going to hit OK. It's really jumbled up. I'm going to space this differently. I'm going to start typing in uniform, make layout uniform. And I get this dialog, 
and I want, oh, uh, let's see here, four systems per page with three on the first page. Yeah, that makes it a little easier to see there, okay? So now what we've got is chord spellings for each of these, chord voicings for each of the symbols. Okay, I'm going to blow off the end here so we have a little more space. You'll notice that uh, it's a little hard to see where the accidental is running into the measures there. So what we got to do is actually, I'm just going to select everything go to appearance and we've got the option to reset our notes by spacing and that's going to resolve that issue with the accidentals okay one more final trick for you in Sibelius if this ever happens to you you got your chord symbols sort of out of alignment to get kind of out of whack like that cool trick select one of the chords there shift command or for key C users control A and then shift command or control R to put them all in a row just like that. All right, that's it for the Sibelius tutorial. We'll see you soon.